one, two, one, two. Good morning, colleagues. Ms. Leila, please join us at the table as well. Good morning, colleagues. My name is Ayan Daholo, and uh, welcome to a workshop of She Trades, uh, focusing on the, the practical side of She Trades. Uh, we are most honored to have uh, amongst us uh, Minister of Small Business. Uh, I think you know her more than uh, me, really doing the practical and onboarding show that uh, we benefit from, from sheep trade. And our broadcast partner, the, the Africa of the Future, uh, Channel Africa, uh, Mr. Chani, uh, she will be telling up with you about the opportunities she has to ensure that, um, that, that, uh, that uh, the benefits they have as a radio station uh, and I'm sure she will be inviting some of you to come and, uh, and speak on the radio so that uh, other women around the country, the continent, Sadek, the continent and the globe can be able to reach you. Uh, so she will, she will have a few words about that. So I, I wouldn't like to, to have long speeches today. It's not about long speeches. The last time I know, Minister, she's an action-oriented person. Uh, it's not about uh, her words, means, and inspire for you to do more than just that information in your head or in your book, but uh, we'll definitely give you that. Let me also ask uh, our DDG, Reho, to please uh, come uh, in, in front and, uh, and uh, um, give us a welcoming address, and then Minister will kick off with the night. Thank you. Through the use of technology, giving access to growth in markets that would not have necessarily, necessarily been the case. Had it not been government commitments and recognition of this key sector of small business being an engine of economic growth. I welcome all those of you who joined us virtually as well, because we've got a virtual platform where we pay to do as a multimedia. And our media partner, Channel Africa, giving us a wider footprint of coverage beyond these four walls. Um, you may wonder why is this um, uh, being the welcome address being done by GCRS. I'm actually representing my DG minister, Ms. Kumla Mutukuri, here this morning. Uh, the role of GCRS government uh, information and government communication and information systems, as you see, um, the banners um, on the side and behind you. It says in Chapter 15 of the MDP of 2030, which highlights social cohesion and nation building and recognizes the role of information and communication provision as empowering citizens and businesses to be informed and make the right choices and participate in programs of job creation, poverty alleviation, and economic development. In this manner, we disseminate information, publish new policies 
from cabinet, uh, as well as parliament, and overall development in government to empower citizens and emerging entrepreneurs to the world of possibilities that is brought about government programs. We are here today to find ways about how best we can increase economic growth and job creation by promoting the participation of women-owned businesses through machine initiative. And I will leave that to our distinguished uh, minister and esteemed panel to um, check more about that. Today's uh, hybrid uh, gathering, as we are here, Chris Bradley and others have joined us virtually, provides us with an opportunity to pause and take stock of the progress that has been made in advancing women's empowerment, I'm sure we will touch on that. Investment in women is one of the most effective developmental tools of our time to both uplift the society and children. We know that when you empower women, you empower a nation. I recognize the gentleman in the audience as well, but I'm sure there are powerful women behind you. And evidence has shown that in developed and developing economies that when women join the labor force and in particular become entrepreneurs, there is a rise in gross domestic, gross domestic product. Women entrepreneurs are also known to use profits from their businesses to improve their families and their living conditions and lifestyles. More importantly, they invest in their children. Actually, we, let me say we, because I'm also a mother and, uh, and a woman. Uh, we invest in our children, we invest in our education, and uh, we increase uh, our children's opportunities and uh, amenability to get better jobs and breaking the cycle of poverty. Through this lively discussion that we are about to get into, that is to follow women and undoubtedly learn from each other by exchanging favorable viewpoints and uh, see how is it that we can improve um, our aging economy. We should also use this time to find lasting solutions to the challenge facing the global economy. I hope you find today's discussion rewarding and I look forward to your insights. Before I take my seat, my seat, I would like to uh, invite the minister to the podium. But uh, before minister, you come in, because not everyone uh, has been privy to your bio. And uh, for the benefit of our media partners that have joined, uh, Minister um, Stella Tebisa Gabeni Abrahams is the current minister of small business. Since the 5th August 2021, Minister, you're about to get to your one year anniversary. <laughs> she is the Minister of Communication. She was the Minister of Communication um, of the Republic of South Africa from the 22nd of November 2018 to the 5th of August 2021. Uh, Minister was previously a Deputy Minister of Communication uh, from May 2014. March 2017, and subsequently as Deputy Minister of Telecommunication and Postal Services from November 2018. Prior to 2014 general elections, Minister was Deputy in uh, the then uh, DOC uh, from October 2011 to uh, May 2014, mm. which demonstrates the wealth of uh, mm. uh, knowledge and uh, the powerhouse that we have. Um, the minister has also been a member of various parliamentary committees. I'll just mention that communication and, um, and community um, chief whip, community whip in 2021, uh, defense and uh, community, community whip of 2019 to 2011, defense and intelligence, uh, and she's currently a member of ACE.
knowledge and understand what love will open for us. Of course, the DVD and Brian has just welcomed us. If we were at home, and the home for us, there's a learning And the reason we found it's important that we engage and go through to these provinces was simply because we wanted to engage with those that are involved in the day-to-day -day work that we are getting paid for. And this meant that we couldn't sit in our offices, we couldn't just rely on the posts that were given by our graduates, but we needed to go out and engage with the entrepreneurs at a local level district and provincial. But in those engagements at the center of them was trying to understand <coughs> this work that we're responsible for so that we are able to pick up on the gaps in the interventions that we provide as department and government. We've had lots of exciting stories and experiences in those wonderful engagements that we've had. In each and every province that we've been to, contrary to the popular belief, where it, we normally refer to the youth as the lost generation. We were proven otherwise. And this was evidently blown up when you saw this week on social media, Amma 2000 telling us who we are and what we do, as opposed to who they are. These exciting ideas presented to us a generation that is very focused and very clear of what it wants to achieve. This is not a generation that will be taken to school and they will take any other option outside what they wanted to do as their passion, but because there's a second choice, third choice, and they'll set for that. This is a generation that will say, I want to take a gap here. I'm taking a gap here because I'm undecided as things that. Because they want to make sure that when they get involved, they get involved knowingly very well what contribution they will make. And indeed, those that have been privileged enough in the institutions of higher learning, they are making their own mark. Those that then decided that you're going to go for entrepreneurship, indeed, they're making their own mark too. We've seen so many products that have been produced by young, especially women in our country. That we take pride as we crisscross not only South Africa, but the continent, as we've been doing with the trade program that we're here for. To say, let's have our sources. Let's make sure that everybody gets to know the work that has been done not by government in some instances, but the work that our young women, young and old women have undertaken. Starting with the women who brave all the storms and go to the taxi ranks and other areas to send for thereby generating income in order for them to make a difference in their households and the difference in the society. So coming here to talk about this program that is very close to my heart gives us an opportunity to really live on what we believe 
both as a member of the ANC, which is a government party, and as the minister responsible for small business development in our state. I'm not a minister of small business. I'm a minister for small business development. That's the key word in the work that we do, right? Development. It's not about small business, but they are developed. And this is the story that we are trying to ensure that it doesn't end here. It continues and we get the businesses out of that. So what it presents is for us to say, what is it that we are doing collectively as government and the private sector here at home and outside South Africa? The partnership that we're talking about, of course, working with the International Trade Center the European Union and their EDSC program. All we want to, to do is to increase, enhance the participation, meaningful one, meaningful one. There is participation where in everyone comes, right? But ours is to ensure that there's meaningful and effective participation of both youth and women in our economy. We have therefore put measures in place to say how do we onboard some of these women on business through the street trade hub, the street trade hub, that is the South African component of women that are trading in the platform. We do have Ms. Sharia, who's going to talk into trade, as the chancellor who's responsible for that process. We aimed at ensuring that at least 10,000 women, at least, I'm not saying that's the man. If, we were, if it's possible for us to go to 100,000 women on, let's go there. But at least 10,000 women should be on board. And there's a, as things stand, we are talking about 30,000, that at least has already been in place. But at the center of this, if we're talking about women empowerment, it's not only looking at those that are ready to trade that must therefore join the platform. As I said, at the center of the work that we do is that diplomatic aspect of the work that we do, which means even if you are a micro business, even if you are a corporate <coughs> or small and medium, you have a responsibility to lift you as you rise. And we do believe that as you rise, we lift other cities, just as national of Manchester. And in doing that, we have deployed many products that we believe that will make a difference in the development of small businesses. One of them is that that looks at the challenges that are faced by the township and rural businesses. In most cases, we come and talk about these things. There's a need for us to bridge the gap. We are striving towards an inclusive economy. But when resources allocation time comes, we do forget to deploy those resources in those township and rural areas. And then we sit here and talk of a South Africa that has lots of and of inequalities. What role are we playing? As GCIS that is spreading the message on behalf of government, are we really touching the mass of everyone as you are the past? And of course, I'm just saying GCIS is applied to everybody who's sitting here. I'm just making some hope because they are our host. And in doing this, we said, let us be deliberate, satisfied about. 980 million rents, that should go towards a fleet map of those small businesses in the township and rural areas. As things then, our care for those that are applying for the support is 1 million rents. I'm sure seated here, if you understand the township and rural ecosystem, you will agree with me that that's too little. It is the township and rural areas that still struggle with connectivity. It is the township and rural areas that still struggle with infrastructure, whether it's road infrastructure, whether it's water, sanitation, or energy. It is the townships, again, that must flock to the cities and cause all the unnecessary stamping and therefore destroying and breaking the bylaws that are put in place by municipalities. Because we have not developed much in those townships. And the then days, if you recall, we will have our, um, I don't know why we never had Stella and Dotas, but we would have 
and Bonge Kile and Chris Sands. I don't know if you've been to Catholic and Township. Mm. But those general dealer shops that were there, that were providing everything, and some of them were subsidized by government. And this is what we're saying, we need to revive. Because if the economy was growing, jobs were created, and entrepreneurship was instilled mm. at that level, there's nothing stopping a democratic government in reigniting those and make sure that our people can participate. So under those products of the TREP, we call it TREP, Township and Rural Enterprise Program. As you apply for one, your one million grant, if your program requires that, there's basic things that you need to have because this is government money. And for government money, there should be evidence that indeed Stella is not a gift. Stella is a person who leads. Stella is a person who is a South African, but Stella is a person that is trained. It's very important because we can already be alive, but some of us are not trading, but it shifts the system to us as well. So out of that one million, a component goes to a grant, and another component goes to a loan, which is what we call blended funds. We introduced the grant component because we are appreciative of the challenges that SMMEs go through in terms of financial support. That it doesn't mean that if we have approved your 1 million or your 800,000, your 300,000 rand for whatever business that you are running, it doesn't mean that next month you'll be able to pay us back or business would have kicked off. We are appreciative that you may start your product or as you seek to, to expand if you were already in business, you may face what COVID brought to us, that you don't trade for a particular number of months for reasons beyond your control. But we don't want you to die. That's why we introduced the grant component to say, at least kickstart and therefore be able to take care of certain things whilst you're going to be paying back the loan because our loan has to be paid back so that we can reinvest in other entrepreneurs. We have listed a number of products that I'm going to challenge you to go and read in our website. Whether you go to www.dsbd.gov.za or www.cfa.org.za or www.cda.org.za, you will get the same information. If you go to the departmental one, you can click on CIFA, click on CIFA to see exactly what our portfolio agent is doing. This enables you to say, if I want to apply for the Shisanyam in a township, because we again to one day, I'm not kind of. <laughs> If you want to apply for automotive um, a repair shop, because our cars need to be fixed in the township too. They don't have to travel all the way like it happens in my hometown when I come from the Eastern Cape. If you own a Mercedes Benz or BMW, you have to drive all the way from Kazakhstan to get it set. And we are saying, gone are the days that township people are only good for consumption. If they can buy your cars, it means you can give them an opportunity to service your car. And this is all we are talking about. If you believe that they can do anything, allow them to contribute towards the supply and value chain. Because if we're not doing that, then it means people are going to continue to go and fight for the tenders that the municipality gives, even though they do not have the relevant expertise. But the center of this work, as I said, is to ensure that we have a mind shift of ensuring that our people do not only become job seekers, but they become job creators. But they can only do that when there is sufficient support. In most cases, if you go to the township CDG or in the tax rent, for example, you'll find that there's a bush mechanic I am. Who sits there, others have not even gone to school, but it's a talent that God has given to him or her. And you will bring your cars there, and you will make sure that they are fixed and you will live. But when time comes where you have to pay, when you go to your insurance that you pay every day, how many of them get to find them? And this is when we are saying, we really have extensive role in ensuring that we reach out to the private sector, which contributes and owns 70% of the GDP that we have. Government only contributes 30%.
So as we find about the opportunities, let's know that the opportunities are there in the private sector. There's also what we refer to as the informal uh, economy, where our bushmakers belong to. Where do they benefit if they come across doing this? This is when we say CEDA, let us enhance our capabilities in ensuring that we are able to provide the business development support. And women and young people can only thrive if we invest more in them. I'm not saying because they're special type, not that we're not, but because of the exposure in the areas that we're working in. Very few people still have confidence that we can have girls doing mechanics. Although they go to school, but if they think they do it at home, very people, very many people are reluctant to go there. Now to instill that, that girls are capable, and when we talk about that equality, it means as we are born from these wombs that we come from of these women, we are taken to the same schools, we are given the same talents. Therefore, it doesn't make any difference because we are of different gender positions. We have therefore moved from that to ensure that we target young people through the youth challenge fund. We have set aside 600 million rent for businesses owned by young people. And in this one, we were deliberating saying we are looking at addressing <coughs> unemployment and poverty, but we also have a responsibility to grow the economy. If you read the National Development Plan, it says by 2030, South Africa must, con must create 11 million jobs. And out of 11 million jobs, 9 million will come from SMEs. It is the NDPs that say that. It is not President Ramaphosa who says government does not have a responsibility to trade jobs. It's the NDP. He is explaining what is in the NDP. That was not a government or government plan only by a societal plan. <coughs> now, if you are sitting here, did you say South Africa has 13 million unemployed people? What does that say about us? Not government only, but all of us that adopted the national development plan. It says we have failed to do what needed to be done, which means we failed to invest in small businesses so that they can create the it is very clear, it doesn't say big businesses are going to create. It says small businesses are going to create almost 90% of the jobs that ought to be created. And the only way, as I said, is to invest in them. The first element, as I said, is the business development support, the capability of how to do business. Because you may have gone to school to study for a particular course, you may have a God given talent, but one thing about our sector, it doesn't care about grades even if you have never been to school. No matter what language you speak or we carry, if you have talent and skill that can change the economy, you are our constituent. But as we do that, the business development skills are not there. It's not something that you're born with. What you would be born with is what you would be able to do, whether you're gonna say you're gonna be a mechanic, then I'm gonna make clothes. We've seen lots of people that design clothes who never went to fashion schools. And then add all the other activities that people are involved in. Therefore, enhancement of the business learning skills becomes very critical. This is why we said CEDA, we've got to beef up our capability internally that Because when you apply for a particular support at CEDA, you should be able to engage with the CEDA business, what do you call them? Consultant. A business advisor that understands if you want to apply for IPPs, what must you do? It means you need energy it means if you want to talk everything for AI, when you say, you know what, you're developing a system and you want to deploy AI, they must have that understanding of what the artificial intelligence is and what value can it add in your business. Same applies to agriculture, same applies to other sectors. So that's why we said we really have to beef up that capability. Now, the government, as part of responding to the challenges that were posed to us, by COVID-19 and the July 2021 unrest, has since developed the economic reconstruction and recovery plan. And at the center of it is the development and support of small businesses. 
Now, this tells you that as government, we do acknowledge that without putting the small businesses at the center, we're not going to turn the tide, we're not going to grow the economy, we're not going to ensure that people are participating uh, inclusively, we're not going to ensure that people are employed if we contribute to it. That's why you find that the small business economy is at the center of the economic recovery and the construction plan. To an extent that now we are engaging with everyone, and President Ramaphosa went ahead to appoint Mr. Ngozi, who is the red tape tie in his office, to collaborate with all the parties that are involved in red tape. Again, I end up with hats, learned people, clever people, smart people say, Hi, President Ramaphosa, you're so scared of this minister. They are so incompetent, but you can't find them. Instead, you do the big jobs. As if DDG, from the Department of Small Business <coughs> Development, will be able to award people water rights. As if we'll be able to say, okay, we're going to do rezoning for the land that you are requiring. As if we'll be able to say, for you to trade, we've got to introduce the incentives. I'm making just examples of the red tape. And that again exposed the ignorance of the land on understanding the things that are critical at this time as opposed to what those that came before us did. Those that understood the challenges that they were faced with and they made it their responsibility to understand the system and they started it and they did it. Today we come up with them. If you look at what they did about Nelson and others, when they were excluded, because they knew that for our people to be excluded, whether it's on land, whether it's on economic activities, the legislation was passed, which means they needed to understand how law works. And they went and studied law. Unlike us, they did not become selfish with the knowledge they acquired. They shared that knowledge, used it to benefit others that had their human rights and trust. And they thought, indeed, we're talking about socialism. It's the same thing that's required of us, entrepreneurs. If we are to deliver economic freedom for us and for the generations to come, we need the entrepreneurs that understand the ecosystem. If you shy away from a legislative framework process, you are depriving yourself. Because if you don't think it's important that you must attend all those IEDP meetings by the municipality, wherein they put plans, wherein they develop bylaws. Tomorrow, when you trade, you may come back and be told that you are breaking this law and you didn't even know that it exists. Because if you are to sell bread, you've got to know that I'm going to sell bread, and for me to sell bread, I need this to bake, I need flour, I need this, and who are the people that are going to supply me? so that you don't run out of the supplies that you need to produce bread. Because your business plan has to look at all of those to say, I want to make sure that I become the first person in my village who owns the new spare, for example. Okay, you franchise spare, you want to. But I make an example, it's a brand that you have to go to the farm to. And when you do that, the first thing, if you are a smart person who understands what needs to be done, is to say, okay, if this is a, a food uh, or a restaurant, who's going to supply me with potatoes? Because these people love potatoes, fried potato chips a lot. Who's going to make sure that provides me with lettuce if I am going to make burgers? Where's the panty going to come from? And all those things that go to the meals that we'll be selling understanding the ecosystem of your own business. <clears throat> because in the event you wake up like we see it today, there's a fight between Russia and Ukraine, and people were like, ah, it's not the same stuff that we're not involved. Until it hits you when the petrol prices go higher, and food <clears throat> and other commodities go higher because the price of oil, oil has gone up because of the conflict somewhere. So bringing this ecosystem together to say the legislative environment, understanding of the trade laws, 
looking into the ecosystem in terms of the supply. Because once you look at that, then the demand will be created. There is nothing bad like a person who gets into business, is being able to get all of us excited, and six months or two years down the line, one can no longer afford to meet the targets. And the targets are created by the demand that he created or she created to say, I have these shoes, this brand is mine, and then as the time goes on, one can no longer produce those numbers and people are coming to us, we love your shoes or your hats, and now you can't because NAG has beat you low shipping, it's one of the issues. So as you plan your business, in the event of low shipping, how is it going to impact on my business? And these are all components of running a business. So we are working with different partners looking at those, and those are the right things that we talk about. People tend to think that, no, it's only money, it's only facts. Yes, we do agree, there's lots of critiques that at times we believe that are unnecessary, and we have agreed that we've got to do away with those, starting with the amendments on the legislations that we have. As I said, it starts there. Because whatever that you set in terms of the tone on your legislation is what everybody will use, whether to include or to exclude. Which is why, again, we urge all our officials who do procurement to also take that into consideration. We know that the PSMA is a and we also look at the disadvantages of the PSMA that continues to exclude our small businesses from participating in government procurement. What are the figures of the spend by government towards SMEs? Do you know? Do you know for yourself? Hmm? 30% of the amount. I see the 30% percent but but are we meeting that? Out of the entire budget that government has, the procurement that go to small businesses, yes, set aside 30%, but even that 30% is not defined. You are made to go and compete with big businesses. And you are saying you want to grow the economy, you want to create jobs through small businesses. There is a contradiction. That's why I'm saying it's important that as entrepreneurs, you make it your responsibility to tease out all these things that are a risk to the success of your business. And if you don't understand that, and you can't, you are not able to articulate them in a manner that says, hold it, government. You have said you want to create an enabling environment for small businesses, but this legislation does not support that. It contradicts actually what you want to do. You know it better. Us here as public officials only know the frameworks that talks to the bureaucracy that you must apply. You are hustlers. You know what it means that when there's a tender issued by GCIS, you must run to SAS because they want your tax clearance certificate, you must run to UIF, you must run to all those things that you must bring for you to fill in a tender. And you know that it's costing you money because your time as a small business is money. If you're running around doing those, by the time you come here and then you must go and meet with the person that's going to do a business plan, as a business plan, and then they say the closing time date is the 29th of June, 12 o'clock, and you're sitting there, you are worried, you are panicking, staying in a queue. It has a direct impact on how your business does. And this is why we said there's a need for us to create a one-stop center for small businesses. Starting by merging CEDA, CIFA, and CBDA. And again, you get to see all these red tapes when we want to do that because these are organizations that are established through the law, we must go back and amend the law. And even though we all agree that we need one agency, but you can't wake up and go to parliament and say, here's the law. We've got to undertake all those processes, 60 days consultation, this and that, and then another person comes and takes you to court. And then the legislation is delayed. But the problem continues that small businesses are excluded and suffer. So if we don't embark on those dialogues and make sure that as entrepreneurs we go out there to educate people about what entrepreneurship is about and the value that it has in the development of our society, you're going to continue missing out. So it's important that we get involved. We have engaged with municipalities in relation to bylaws, those that are coming from the Western Cape or those that have read. You may have seen at some point, I think it was last year or, or beginning of this year, 
when we had a group that, of women that was chased away because they were trading illegally, did you see? They were selling poultry mm -hmm. and they were taken to some house in what is that, what's that, some valley mm -hmm. because they couldn't trade that. And everybody made noise. Where's the Department of Small Business Development? Why is government doing this? But the people of Cape Town failed to look at the bylaws that they had. Because you can move from Pretoria and pass the bylaws in Cape Town. And as, as national government, you have no responsibility for bylaws. Which is why we talk about the coordination and the integration of the work across all spheres. And in this regard, we passed the DG Act, the District Women Model, that must ensure that there's alignment between the local economic development strategies and the work that we do at this level. Because if we can see that CIFA, DTIC, and all the important people that give you financial support, if we come without having that appreciation of what are the economic development plans, it means that at times we may miss the target. We're not talking to each other ourselves, the strategy, and development happens at the local level. That's why it's important to understand those partners, because they will therefore influence whatever legislation we take at national level. So I urge all of you to participate in those. I urge all of you to make sure that you utilize every platform that we see, including advising us, as I said, we are not all entrepreneurs in the department of economy. But we have a responsibility to create a conducive environment. Now, this requires us to work together. We are stuck in our matrimony. But if there's a one that is not functioning, then it continues to bring a challenge to us. We've set aside some of two billion words that must go towards a small business which could see fun. And again, we have looked at the disparities that we have. As we look at the studies, as we check everything, where does the money go to? Everybody is talking about supporting small businesses. And then we saw that most of the support that we provide goes to the Western Cape province, to Gauteng province, and Etekwin, not Wazulu Natal, and Etekwin, majority of the support. It goes to the concentrated developed areas. And now, if you're looking at an economy like ours, it requires to move from the village, as I said, to the urban area. And TREF is there to respond to that. Therefore, that two billion dollars is there. It means we must therefore allocate more to the rural provinces as much as we ensure that not less than 200 million goes to each province. Now, again, that goes back to yourself in making your responsibility to read and reach out on the information that us as the department are providing and other FGIs that we have under DTIC and other departments, the land bank and everybody. Because these things are interlinked as well. Now having done all of that, we've given you money, we've empowered you in terms of the business development skills. How do we then make sure that you're able to access the market? And this is what we are about today. The trades are to provide that access to market for women-owned businesses, not that others who don't have platforms. Or as we continue to participate in the ACFTA and other platforms to ensure that businesses are there. But specifically for women-owned, she trades are present that opportunity to say, this is the access, that this is the platform that we're providing for you, register your business, and we help you to be market ready and understand the African and the international dynamics when you're trading. She will expand on that. We've taken a group of, as the name is uh, last year, she's in heaven. March, we went to Zanzibar. In Kenya, we had about 20 women owned. We've went to um, Saudi, they've gone to, they've been traveling, they will talk to you soon. And all of these are meant to expose women because we travel with these women that are owning this business to showcase the work that they are doing. Now remember I said, if you just come to get 50% that after three years you're down, it also has an impact on the reputation of the brand that you are carrying yourself. That countries now can they rely on us to say, we know that we're gonna buy 
um, Nats from South Africa. Or for oh. our bags as Gucci, <coughs> we know that South Africa has very nice zebras, where therefore we can source zebra skin or whatever skin that we're providing to those that are making bags, for example, the big brands that put you up. How do we leverage on those, utilizing what we have? If we fail after chairs, means we were not sustainable. And this is where it matters. After all those stages of business development support, the financial support, when you get to the market, you've got to be make sure that you go in there and you stay. Instead, you can expand. You can't afford to come out. And she says provide that, that, that opportunity that we work with all the partners to make sure that we scale up whatever product because it has to meet the demand. Because now you represent South Africa. Once you get into the platform career, you represent South Africa. And this is something that I've been telling small businesses as we continue to engage. We go to meetings, I am the wedding, we meet small businesses who come in and they scream in meetings. Once I understand the frustrations, but a business is a business and we expect a particular quality. Doesn't matter if you're small. That's a business language. Now imagine we've taken you here, we put you on sheet trays, and there comes Uganda and says, we would like to get Stella's products. And then you come and become Stella there, not representing the brand of the company. We're bringing you to this platform, and when you come here, you are presenting your brand. And once you get international to South Africa, no one stops you. That's why it's important that we make it our responsibility to make sure that you will comply. Now, when we are there, we no longer very nice, as I said, because it can then create chaos and tensions amongst the countries because we have trade agreements that we enter into. And these are the things that we need to understand as small business. Again, the support is available, as I said. But let me tell you, before I sit down, because we've got panelists and the time is about you, the day is about you. It's not about us putting speeches. It's about you interacting with the information that we're imparting. Let me tell you that we are doing everything as the AC government to make sure that we address these imbalances by saying let's get coordinated. This morning before I came here, I met with the UNDP team, which is doing lots of work for our small businesses. And this is why we have said as a department, we are changing shift in terms or approach in terms of what we are doing. We're not in what looking anymore to say government, government, government. We need to look into the ecosystem. As I said, 70% is in the private sector. How do we reach out? They also have certain things that we must make sure that we comply with. Ladies and gentlemen, I can go on and on. As I said, this is our story. It doesn't end here. Let's work together in making this change. And the AT government does this too. Thank you. Minister, uh, I think uh, colleagues, uh, you all heard, but one thing I think we should all take is that uh, it's not going to be one of us without the rest of us. So the information you're gathering here, please make sure that you pass it to other businesses in your supply chain. I think um, if we are to get to the 100,000 